Welcome into the lounge presented by DraftKings. We are thrilled to sit down with tight end Charlie Kohler. And, and Charlie, we had to invite you onto the lounge after we heard your quote uh, post game about how <laughs> they forgot, you know, everybody's paying so much attention to Mark and Isaiah, and they forgot about the fat white guy running down the seam, right? And <laughs> as two fat white guys, we were like, this, it really resonated with us. Yeah. It's right? a trio here. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. That's why they forget about us all the time, yes, too, right? True. We're just sure. overlooked yes. in the organization. Yes. Um, so take me inside. What's going through your head as they're just, you know, I saw, I watched the tape of that play. Geno Stone's shading over to Isaiah Likely nope. spot. You're just trucking down the middle, baby, just wide open. What's, what's going through your head on that play? Yeah, there was a, I mean, I wasn't totally kidding on in all the dumb comments I was making. They did, for, <laughs> they did you know, cut me loose, but uh, I just, I knew I had that, um, that play, like, you know, tight end four verts is hard to cover a lot of times. Yeah. Teams are in single high because they only have three guys deep. So usually whichever side this uh, safety shades to, they could throw the other way. So when I saw Gino rotate away, I was like, oh, Mike, Mike get some action here. So <laughs> I was pretty excited. Lamar threw a beautiful ball and uh, protection was great. And uh, it was pretty cool. Yeah. Now I know uh, Lamar even today was kind of giving you a hard time on podium. He said he's he's got to score. He, yeah, he's got to stop getting chased down on these. Yeah. So <laughs> so I mean it's kind of stinks. You have, here you have great play there, great play Dallas, and now you're just getting your teammates around your butt again. Yeah. I, um. I uh I hit over the sideline afterwards, and the first thing he says is you got to score. I was like, <laughs> great ball, Al. <laughs> but no, he's a, he's awesome. Man. He's right though. I gotta I gotta score. I gotta stop getting tackled out of the ten. But um no, he's a I mean. It's very easy to play with Lamar sometimes. Like it's a perfect ball. You know, he does a good job of leading the safety off, right. and uh, he make he does a really good job of you know making our job easier. So, right. So for anyone who hasn't seen it, fans, listeners, you need to go back and watch Charlie's full post game presser scrum after the game because it is comedy. That was just that was great. That, that white guy up. quote was just one of many in that little <laughs> yeah. two minute. I mean, it was a stand up monologue basically. <laughs> <laughs> was that? Uh, and you even joked during that time. You said, "I'm not answering anything serious during mm-hmm. this." So, did you go into it with it with that attitude of basically having delivering these great one liners, or what was the thought process going into this post game scrum? Can't say there was a whole lot of thoughts <laughs> running through my head at that time. Uh, I was tired from the game, and I was on cloud nine. We just won, and, you know, crazy comeback. You know, I mean, they're lining up for a game winning field goal. I think I lose, and then yeah. like less than three minutes, whatever later, we just won. So. It's like, <laughs> It was pretty pre- elated, and then, um, you know, there was some truth in all my dumb comments, like they, like, like they did cut me loose and stuff. But uh, I was just, I don't know, I, I was just kind of speaking from, I wouldn't say the heart, but just, the head, <laughs> just the first stop that yeah. came through my head. I, I, just, I have a tendency to ramble, and so I just let it all out. So uh, it's kind of interesting, though. I, I feel like your personality has come out a lot more this year. Is that true? I mean, I probably was naturally a lot more reserved when I was a rookie. You know, you're just not as comfortable. And also, I wasn't playing very much. I was just trying to, you know, come in and do my job. But um, I think it's like most people, as you get more comfortable in your job and with your teammates, you people tend to, like, uh, like relax a little bit more, come out of their shells. And I'm sure that's part of me doing that. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I just – I. I feel like I'm the same person, but it's it's a uh, we're just it, seeing more of it. This I, year. I think I think like when you talk to guys, like you're one of those guys who, when we ask our players, like when they're coming off the field for our social media things, uh-huh. like who's the most obnoxious guy in the locker room, who's the loudest, who's the most likely to give you a heart. Like Charlie pops up in a lot of those answers, right? Like I feel like Hopefully not the most obnoxious. I don't, <laughs> all three of those weren't very positive. <laughs> I wasn't open. So I guess set the record straight. Like what is your niche? Like what's your role your personality like in the in the framework of of this team well hopefully on the field my role is just you know continue to you know block well on the edge in the perimeter and then um well i mean in the locker room oh, you i mean, mean like, personally socially yes socially, socially. what's the social <laughs> role of charlie kohler in this locker room it's hard to have like a social role. i feel like it's just kind of organic um i'd say i'm comfortable in my own skin maybe like too comfortable sometimes uh <laughs> very uh, just like, I don't know. I, I don't, it's not that I don't care what people think. Cause like, I'm not that like selfish. Like I, you know, I want to be respectful and polite, but it's like, I am like comfortable with who I am. And like, I know that I like, put everything I have into my job and like, I tr- truly care about my teammates, but like all like, things are like not as important. Like it would be a dumb comment or like, maybe I should like wear more clothes sometimes. Like this, uh, 
I just don't really care that much. I don't know where you come from when I'm scared. It's funny. Well, one thing I started noticing, I, maybe you've always done this. You you do pregame warm ups. You walk around with that shoes a lot, right? Yeah, I just got in trouble with that today, actually. So I got to start wearing more shoes. What, on the field? Pregame? Uh, or where did you, you get coach? Shoes? No, I just, I need to wear more shoes like in like meetings and stuff. Oh, too. you didn't wear shoes in the meetings? <laughs> I didn't know that part. So is the complaint like the smelly feet? What's the complaint? I think it's the professionalism aspect. <laughs> okay. Which okay. is totally understandable. Understandable. Right. I, um, but I, I do like to, uh, well, I am a big believer in grounding with like, you know, walking barefoot, like on actual like grass mm. and stuff. You know, I think that it's good to like kind of, I don't want to get too like hippie, but like reconnect with like the earth in terms of. Like, I don't know, like we weren't designed to walk on concrete and right. shoes all day. Like, right. I don't, I don't think it's like too crazy to think that it could be good to get, get reconnected. But then in general, <laughs> I just like being barefoot. I don't know. Like I've always liked being barefoot. Like I think it's comfortable. Um, I don't like wearing shoes really. Uh, yeah, it's a bad I, I can you, see you wearing those five fingers. Have you ever worn those? I, so these are like the barefoot style ones. I have a few of these. I haven't actually had the five fingers, but also I have like a, like a giant gap between my big toe and my index toe. So yeah, I might not say Just one more. <laughs> you have to get custom ones. Well, no, like I used to joke that like uh, my, my my friends used to call me like no toe sometimes because like I was like, it's like, it's pretty big. Like it's a pretty big gap. <laughs> and uh, I used to say, I used to mess with people. And the thing about like people, if you know, so over the years, people, t- like I was along, like I've been in the organization for a while. Like they, they think I'm like decently smart, which is like, I think I'm a solidly smart guy. But what I've learned is that when you have that perception, you can say a lot of stupid things confidently. People will believe you because like, just like I believe you. So sometimes like people ask you about it. I'm like, yeah, man, I had to get it cut off when I was little. I had six toes. I'm like, no way. I'm like, yeah, no way. It didn't happen. <laughs> it didn't happen. But, That's um, amazing. No, yeah, I, I do like to be barefoot, but I, I, they are correct. I should wear more shoes in the work purse. You, you mentioned that people think you're smart. It's for good reason, though. When you were in college, you won. Correct. What, what, what was the award again? It was the Campbell. The Campbell, Campbell Award. Right. The, Campbell the award. academic Heisman. The academic Heisman. Mm-hmm. Um, when you were at Iowa State, and so, and you were a mechanical engineering major yep. in college. So, I mean, were academics something like when you were in college that that was something that was really important to you, and you take a lot of pride in winning that award? Yeah, I mean, my, my parents are both professors. Um, it's a family. We're very strict uh, academics growing up, just kind of strict in general. But and they're fantastic parents. And uh, my mom is in the law school, teaches like criminal procedure, kind of death penalty stuff over the years, different stuff. And then my dad is in civil engineering at back home, chair of civil engineering. So it's a very uh, rigorous academics growing up. My my middle brother is actually the the quite brilliant one. He uh, it was funny. I always think it's okay to brag if it's not you. He took the ACT and he got a 36, which already is the highest score available. But then he got his answer score back and there was no marks on it. And like he thought it was like unfilled in until he realized he didn't miss a question. The <laughs> whole test, like four hours. Wow. He's brilliant, Sam. Absolutely brilliant. And like not just like, you know, like socially awkward brilliant where you can't talk to. He's also witty. He's right. going to be, uh, I'm going to vote for him someday for something. But uh, <laughs> he's great. That's awesome. That's awesome. You know, is, he, is he in college now? Uh, he just he's, um, he just graduated. Just okay. This reminds me of uh, my first date with my wife when I found out that she got a higher score in her SATs when she was in middle school than the one that I got, uh, you know, put on my college uh, application. <laughs> Sorry, Maddie's far smarter than me and, and uh, – <laughs> It's like definitely the bigger thing to have noticed. I think this is true for almost all relationships, but my friends commonly say to you is girls always have better memories on everything, mm-hmm. like remembering things. <laughs> so like I'm really struggling to remember what I had for breakfast and she can remember anything. And like and my worst thing is like, you know, we start talking about like plans or something. And I'm like, oh gosh. I think we talked about this. So, <laughs> I'm afraid to ask. And not right. that she's going to snap at me. I'm just embarrassed. <laughs> and, uh, but no, she's fantastic. And, That's uh, awesome. Blessed. What, um, at what point did you know football was your, your future? Or did you think you might go into engineering? Yeah, I really, um, you know, I never like, uh, I didn't like think I was like that good going like I was a very small recruit in high school. I only had a few offers. Um, and then in college, I didn't play my first year, year and a half, two mm-hmm. almost. And uh, it wasn't until my redshirt sophomore year, I had a good season statistically and I had a few like honors and stuff. And then my coaches started talking about like someone asked me if I'm going to put my name in the draft. And I never really thought I never really thought about it. And then I did. And I got to sit back in school. 
And uh, I say it's called like probably 2019, 20 years. So I kind of had a mm-hmm. feeling I might be able to make, but still, like this big business is so fickle, and like there's so much luck involved. You know, injury, right situation. You know, you do everything you can to put yourself in the best spot, but at the end of the day, like there is a ton of luck. And so, like I've always tried to work as hard as I can, and leave the rest up to God. And um, I feel like I've been blessed so far. Right. Mm-hmm. So it's you know interesting. You kind of remind me a little bit of of john urschel you know in the sense that he was a former ravens player i'm not sure but he was also a very smart guy who was very interested in the academic side of things and so when he came here he ended up retiring early after his second or third season um and went to go be a professor and so to the point of like when did you know football was the route that you wanted to go like obviously you could have a career in the mechanical engineering side and and go that route like what was it that that like kind of made you feel like i'm going to really pursue this football thing rather than like the academic Side was John Urschel like math? Was that, he, was he, was math. math. he was math. Yeah. I think I think I met him. I think he won the Campbell Award. Yeah, like I think is, that's correct. Because I think I met him. He talked about this. Yeah, he left yeah. to do math, right? Yeah, he, he left yes. after like his yeah. third season. Yeah, he, was, he was like a he, I mean, MIT professor now. He was super impressive. Yeah. I, he, um, I mean, I the like the beautiful but also like kind of sad thing with football is that it's not that long. Mm-hmm. You know, like, even like if you're truly blessed and you get a ten plus year career. You're 35, right? You know, like, there's just a lot of that, like, right. for that. So, like, yeah. for me, it's like the perspective of you know, I also I love football. Like, I love football. I love okay. like the team effort, the physicality, like the game, the planning, like everything about it. Um, so, like, I want to play football. Like, that's like I mm-hmm. I know that like that's an option. Like, I don't look at it as like a escape bag. Like, I put all my what's the like the Kobe said like don't put all your eggs in one basket, make a bigger basket. I put all my eggs in like this basket. Like, like <laughs> this is my job. Like, I'm gonna try to do everything I can. To get everything I can out of my body, and and when it's done, I'll move on. But like, I genuinely love football, so it's like mm-hmm. uh, I might joke around a lot. But like, I love like competing. With, like, there's nothing like a locker room after a win. Like, there just isn't. Yeah, and so we like, saw that on Sunday. Yeah, exactly. You guys were there. So like the, the like the true sense of like Harbs talks about his great job. He's talking about like football is fun, not like you know you're drinking with your buddies at the beach fun, but like it's a hard, rewarding mm. like type of fun and he's right about that it's it's beautiful never played in our sport like it so that's, that's cool, cool. Were, your, were your parents like given their academic background were they always into you playing football uh, i mean every parent like growing up you know especially worries about like you know heads like head yeah. injuries and different mm-hmm. stuff and um you know i do stuff for that like i i like work on like you know like shoulder neck strength thing i wear like the giant spaceship helmet you know <laughs> the guardian uh, cap. The guard, the, mm-hmm. i don't wear the guardian cap I, oh, I, you right. Your helmet is a little bit different from everybody it else's. Is, it's the, called the Vices Trench. It's got the big thing. I just I tried it one day and I felt way better, so I started kept wearing it. Gotcha. I don't really care how I look. Um, I haven't done the Guardian cap. I, I might try in the game. I'm. I feel like they say some of the equipment. Kaneko and them were saying that it actually tests just as well with or without it. Mm-hmm. So I haven't worn it. Also, so I, I might try. I don't know. Yeah. But um, no. Yeah. I mean, obviously, parents sometimes worry about this stuff, but they like, you know. They also like, you know, they want us to like chase what we want to do and stuff. Yeah. And they're, I mean, I'm truly blessed. They're fantastic parents. And- yeah. You, you've had an interesting career path so far. I mean, you know, you're, you're drafted in the fourth round and then, you know, Isaiah likely is drafted not long after that mm-hmm. also in the fourth round. So actually, let me just pause there and ask you the question. Be honest with us. When you're a rookie, you just got drafted, you're thinking hurrah, and then a team drafts a player at the same position not long after. What went through your mind at that moment? I mean, it wasn't like, I know like, you want me to say, oh, I was super worried about a tight end, because like, that's like, it's the NFL, like you're going to compete. Like Isaiah, Isaiah is a fantastic player. Yeah. Like, um, I think I myself highly as a player, Mark, Pat, like there's so many fantastic players. So I did like the draft day. You can't spend worrying about like who they're going to draft. Like I'm just so grateful. <laughs> yeah. Like I'm grateful for an opportunity. I'm grateful for an opportunity to compete with, you know, Mark, Isaiah, Pat, everyone. You're going to yeah. compete wherever you go. And so like even that moment, like I'm just grateful. You're just like, on cloud nine. I, yeah, you just like, got drafted. I, I just got drafted. Like <laughs> yeah. if you're going to spend your whole life worrying about that stuff, like you're, you're going to miss the great moments. And yeah. so it's like, I was just so grateful. I was very overwhelmed. You know, I never thought I'd be like drafted. I didn't think about growing up. Like I was not good. Or, and so like to be drafted with my family and like my Maddie and my friends came over, like it was just, uh, it was an awesome day. Awesome day. And I was just so grateful. And, uh, always look back with a yeah. happy heart on that day. So, so then just to continue, you know, you start your, your rookie year, you have a hernia yep. injury early on, which was, is tough, right? Yeah. Like, I mean, bait kind of dealt with the same thing his yep. rookie year. Right. And that setback is, it's already a challenge to come into this league as a rookie yeah. and just 
understand what it means to be a professional, learn the playbook. All of those things are difficult. And then on top of it, you have a setback with an injury. Mm -hmm. Take us inside that time. And and how did you deal with that? How challenging was that for you? Yeah, it was very challenging. I had, so I had a different surgery done in 2020 on a sports hernia, probably not the right surgery. Mm -hmm. I should have the one I did in 22 in Philly, Mm -hmm. Um, but it's, it's over now. Um, so that's frustrating and uh yeah, I just got to a point where like I couldn't really perform. It just hurt so bad every day I couldn't sleep, couldn't really eat and wow. stuff. And so uh I talked to uh Bedroom about it and I ended up having to get surgery and that sucks because you miss training camp and then you have nothing to like you have no proof that you can play. Like you have college tape, everyone has college tape. So it's like right. even when I'm healthy, I come I think I get activated week seven and I get put on the roster after week nine and I'm I'm healthy, but like I haven't done anything. You know, I haven't done anything during training camp. Our room is incredibly deep. That I mean, our room that year was deepest ever was because we had, uh, I think we had seven. Josh Oliver too. Yeah, it was uh, Mark from oldest. It was, okay, Nick, Pat, Mark, Josh, <laughs> and then me and Zay. So six tight ends. <laughs> right, right, right. It's crazy. And five of them have played and I haven't played at all. So it's like, what is the team? Why would the team play me? I've proven nothing. Right. And so like, I'm aware of that, but it's still stunk Like you want to play. Yeah. And so I just like, I just kind of made a decision that um, rookie year, even in the second year, I was inactive a few games early on. I just made a decision that like I was just going to be ready, like, and I was going to do everything I can to be better. So when that time comes, and like I got some slowly got more opportunities down the stretch in twenty three, and then you know this season slowly got more. And like I don't know, I'm, I'm like Dr. Trish, our team, which is fantastic, and she talks about my favorite phrases ever. She says, "You can wait and worry, or you can wait in peace, but either way, you're waiting." <laughs> and I yeah. think about that all the time. Like I'm going to train and prepare and work as hard as I possibly can. So when opportunity comes, I'm ready. But once the work is done, I'm going to wait in peace. And it's, if it comes, it comes. If not, like it's God's plan. So, uh, yeah, I think that it is difficult, but also like it's an opportunity for growth. And so, I don't know. I, I, I've been so incredibly blessed in my life. Like I, I feel like that's the worst struggle I ever have. I've lived a pretty good life. So. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad you brought up Dr. Trish because we actually have an interview with her on the back end of this nice. for World Mental Health Day. And uh, she provides perspective on on what her role is here. So, uh, you know, that nice nice little teaser there from you. She's incredible. Which, uh, Not yeah. only she's like, a, I mean, she's good at her job, no doubt, but she might be, she's one of the warmest, oh, yeah. genuine human beings I've ever met in my entire life. Yeah, she's awesome. Great. She's great. So, so just going back into your, kind of your story. So then this year, you're in this role where obviously Mark and Isaiah had, you know, are kind of established. And then you come into this year, you added weight, right? Or you mm-hmm. basically to get ready for the, right. the blocking role. Yep. Like you kind of just moved into this role where in college you caught a million passes and you were known as a pass catcher. And then you move into a role where like blocking becomes a huge part of your story. You add weight and physically change your body in order to be in best position to do that. Yep. So like, what was that? What did you do to, in order to get yourself ready to do that? Um, I, I just find out, ironically, I just joked about being a fat white guy, but you know, cleaning up my diet, you know, lifting, you know, just like doing things to get stronger and bigger and more explosive and faster. And um, yeah, it's just like this, this sort of being cognizant of the situation. Like, you know, we have uh, two tight ends who have established themselves more than I have in the league in terms of like they have more catches, they have more targets, more yard, touchdown. And so, you know, how do I contribute to the team? Well, it's like the obvious answer is blocking. And I never really did it in college. I thought I don't think I couldn't do it. I just, I wasn't asked. I was asked to be a receiver, much like, you know, Mark and Isaiah are. And so, um, I kind of, especially really more last year, even I like kind of realized that I was like, you know, if I want to play on this team, like I don't want to be an active, you know, I want to contribute. How do I contribute? Well, I think I'm pretty solid in the passing game, but we already have two guys they trust more than me. You know, we've played more, just like they've been healthy. They've played more. Mm-hmm. Um, how do I get on the field? So like I can block. And so like every day I start working on the sled and like my footwork and my pad level and working with Pat, you know, I text Nick sometimes. And so um, just like trying to get better so I can establish a role when the opportunities come to be blocked. And then what does, like Monk talks about, you know, good blocking is rewarded and you get a slip versus Dallas or different stuff. And mm-hmm. so uh, just trying to do everything I can to like be prepared to help the team. I just, I commend you for kind of that, that selfless, uh, selfless outlook that you have, because it's not easy, you know, as you talked about the hernia, then you're behind these other guys. And now, oh, wait, now I have to totally change the kind of player I am, mm-hmm. right? Like that is a tough thing to do. How, how did you, you know, you say, oh, it was just my avenue on the field, but like, how do you kind of keep at bay this like, man, now I'm like giving up what I do best to do something I, I haven't really done. You know what I mean? 
a lot of it comes back to like, you know, like talk, come back to my faith and stuff. And but like, if this is like the cross, I have, if you're saying it's a cross, like, to, you know, to have to change position, that's not a, that big of a challenge. There's, like, there's, a lot, <laughs> there's a lot worse challenges. Like as much as I like I joke around and stuff like there's people who are like starving and like people who like can't, are trying to find their next meal. Like if me having changed, and first of all, I do love blocking. It's fun. Like, right. <laughs> like a four minute drill, like where they can't stop you is one of the most satisfying things in football. Like it's yeah. beautiful. And so. I mean, obviously, it's it's difficult. Like, and there's times where I surely I want. I mean, I'm a I'm a human being. Of course, there's times I want the ball more, just like everyone does. Mm -hmm. But the biggest thing is like reminding myself of like, what can I control? Like, what can I control? And as long as I focus on that, and I can get better at these things, I'm patient. I believe like my time will come in the pass game, and let's keep getting better at the run game. And just further down the career. Almost every tight end who comes in the league is more of a receiving guy right. because, like, that's like typically the ones they see and they draft. Right. So, like, a lot of tight ends have had similar transactions. Like, you know, Josh was all receiver too, as much. Mm -hmm. Right. That's what I was going to ask. How much did Josh's career trajectory rub off on you? Like, seeing him go, he was a big time receiver. Yeah, big time receiver. Yeah, and then turned into a very good blocker for us. Mm -hmm. How much did you lean on him, and what lessons did you take from him? Obviously, he's good. You know, we trained together in offseason after my first year too. He's a good friend of mine. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, just seeing that, it's like, well, shoot, like, that's that's great option. Like, why not do that? And so, right. uh, I mean, obviously, it was like, great to see him. He, like, gets deservingly get paid and playing yeah. good for the Vikings. You know, they're playing some – playing heck of football right now, right now in Minnesota. I know he's a big part of that. So, um, yeah, of course, it's big. Cool to see that and be like, oh, shoot, maybe I can do something similar to that or whatever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So then, you know, just to kind of bring it to present day, like, now you're in this position where you're doing the blocking, but mm -hmm. then you're also making plays in the past game. I actually just saw the stat from PFF that you're the top rated receiving tight end. Do I have He's the top tight end, period. Top tight end, it's period. Top, it's the highest graded PFF tight end in the league. Sweet. Boom. <laughs> That's what you do it all for, right? I will demand a pay raise right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, they I weren't mean, for the shoes thing, right? We gotta <laughs> get past I mean, the shoes thing. <laughs> I mean, that stuff's so fickle. Like, it's a it's a small sample size. Like right. it's, it's week five. And I've always curious how they even grade that stuff because like they don't know our plays. And so mm -hmm. it helps when like two of my biggest completions, no one guards me. So like, <laughs> I'm not going to, I'm not going to try to claim the throne immediately. I'll just keep working day to day. But no, that is cool. I did not know that. That is cool. Yeah. <laughs> and, and just, but just like when you're making, when you, now all that work also, also I, don't think I, give, I don't think I even can demand a pay raise. Just anyone's listening. I'm not. <laughs> Just to clear that up. Your, is your phone buzzing from your agent right <laughs> I now? I just realized that like sometimes when I say things sarcastically, maybe people don't know me as well enough, that I'm not like, I am being sarcastic. I will not be <laughs> demanding anything at all. I will just be coming to work humbly, ready to do my job. <laughs> if anyone's listening, that is what I'm going to do. <laughs> but like, how how rewarding is this right now? Like just be like, you're playing at a high level right now. You're making big plays, like this it's thrilling game. And like, you have some of the biggest, you know, there was a lot of big plays in that game. Um, but you have some huge moments like in that game. Like, all of that to kind of not that that was the I mean it was kind of the culmination but it's not necessary it's not the end of the of the story of course but like how rewarding is it to be able to deliver in those big moments? Yeah, it's it's week six so like I certainly like you said it's really cool but it's not it's just the beginning of the season and hopefully my journey and uh yeah this like can't help but I take selfish pride in doing that you know I'm proud of what I've done but um I think what's more fun and even just the personal accomplishment is like. If you watch like how our team celebrates together, it's pretty special. Like offense, defense, special teams, like you have a lot of guys who are genuinely excited when people make plays. And so like that makes it so much more fun. Mm -hmm. And so like when I make a play and people are excited for me and then they make a play and I'm excited for them and vice versa. Like it's it's so fun. And like that's that like it is it is satisfying to like be done with the game and you know play well personally but nothing like truly feels as like happy and fulfilling as a good team win like it just doesn't like there's nothing like the locker room after a good win so. that's awesome well you had the the game ceiling block for derrick henry or for lamar's run in dallas right we, we saw the, the photo of the, yeah, I got the game <laughs> i did trip on i did trip on like parsons but like i'm not gonna get in a twitter war about how i trip and that okay so. well i i gave you credit because you put it out there didn't you you tweeted the shot of you like getting oh i just you're know, like, like airborne on the it comes back to like what's actually important like it do i care if you like fun of me no like i <laughs> i know i'm doing my job like i know i got tripped and i know i slowed him down a little bit so like there you go i'm at peace like i'm moving on that that was that was well you, i i like that about you you know how to laugh at yourself and like have fun you got to you yeah. have to well and we got to bring it back to i think really what sparked 
this great season that you're you're starting here is the cornrows, right? Oh, yeah, the, yeah, that's funny. The, the braids. <laughs> um, I kind of so, want to bring them back, but that, um, I got to wait till my hair's long enough. They came out in the helmet the first right. time. So. That's the question, right? Yeah. Is is there a chance? There's... I don't know. I mean, the biggest. Okay, let, let's be honest. The biggest person is make sure Lamar likes him because he's a quarterback. <laughs> <laughs> he did seem like he was a fan of him because he is the one choosing the, the targets and stuff. But I actually, I was pleasantly surprised. So I asked, I sit next to Justice in my meetings, and I was talking to him like, like, do you think like because my hair is like solidly curly, it's not like crazy. Right. Like, do you think I can like get rows? Because in, like in college, I tried this dumb. In college, I tried <laughs> to get waves. I've been like six. I'm serious. I was. It was during COVID, and. <laughs> We were all uh, like, I was locked down and everything. I was talking to my team. We were just working on my teammates and my hair. Like when it's like not like this, it's pretty curly. Like it gets pretty curly. Yeah. I was asking my teammates like, what are like the most because the like just, <laughs> just like I was like, what are ways like what causes like them to do that? He's like, it's just like really tight curls, you know, like kind of matted down and stuff. Uh-huh. And I was like, there's Lawrence White, one of my close friends in college. I was like, you think I can get him? I don't know, man. You might want to try it. So I got the whole thing. I got the, I got the do-rag, the wave gel, the brush. <laughs> and I tried for like six months. And I think for like <laughs> two hours of one day, I had some ripples. And, uh, <laughs> and and even waves. It was tough. But, and so I just like, I don't, like I said, I don't take myself too seriously. And like, I'm not like trying to like make fun of anything. I just like want to see if I can do it. Like, I'm just genuinely curious. Right. And so then this off season, I was letting the hair get pretty long. And I saw fast forward next to Justice. I'm like, dude, like, how do you think? Like, because Justice has like, when Justice's hair is long. He's got great braids, like great, mm-hmm. great designs. And um, I was like, who does your hair? And he gave me her number. Shout out Miss Kia, great, does a great job. And uh, <laughs> and I was like, have you have you ever done like white person's hair before? You know, she's like, I've done it. Like it's it's not like as like as common, obviously. But like, I've done it. I was like, yeah, you, know, you can try it with mine. And it was the offseason, so I didn't think much about it. I was stoked. I thought she did a great job. She did. Like, she, she made did. me look pretty solid. For, <laughs> and I was like in- incredibly pleased with how it, she did. So hopefully, but the problem was my hair is so short uh, in the moment that as soon as we wore helmets OTAs, it came out like that. Mm. So I'm hoping it gets long enough and I can try it again. But also like as much as I like say stupid stuff and everything, like, I'm not like genuinely like i didn't do it to like draw attention to myself. Right. Like I genuinely didn't. Like I knew it was going to, but like I genuinely just wanted to see if I could do it, like right. I want to see how it would look. And then I saw Lamar the next day, he put on a store, I was like, oh shoot, so this is gone. But um, it's all in good fun. I mean, I just wanted to see how it looks and I was, I want to shout out Miss Kia again, she did a great job. So. <laughs> well, I think Lamar liked it. I think that passed the test. Well, yeah. the, 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 the photo of the video, uh, the photo of that, you guys at Preakness, that's that hilarious. photo is pretty, uh, that, it, it resurfaced a lot this weekend. Because I know, it, my friends like sent me that, I'm like, that's from a long time ago. But like, I saw that, because Maddie was out here for the Preakness too and we saw that, <laughs> we were dying, because it's so, like, it's such a perfect like encapsulation of like people's reaction when this giant white guy walks up with corn I'm like I do remember though my first day I got them um I was I was golfing with like Kyle and I think Tyler Marlowe and when we got done I stopped at the gas station to get gas and I walk in and there's this like middle-aged black lady with her kid and she looks at me she looks at me and she goes I like your hair. And I was so <laughs> stoked. I'm telling you. Like, it was so genuine. And she just said it. And I was like, dude, that, that's cool. And so I was like pretty pumped. Uh, I was pretty pumped when she said that. And that was like all the vindication I needed. I was, but yeah, I'm, uh, I don't know. I don't take myself too seriously. So. I love it. I, I see I, it. I love yeah. it. Cool. Well, thank you for joining us, You're Charlie. Welcome. Best of luck the rest of the season. Looking forward to a lot more plays and the return of the corner race. Well, well maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys. Welcome back into the Lounge Podcast. We're coming to you from the SeatGeek studio. We also want to mention our partners at DraftKings Sportsbook. They are an official sports betting partner of the Baltimore Ravens. DraftKings Sportsbook, the crown is yours. So, I mean, Charlie is a, is a super entertaining guy. I think uh, we got to know him a little bit better. Yeah. And fans, you know, we see it in the locker room. Like, he's just a funny dude and, like, gets along with everybody. He's a unique cat. And, like, you, you got to love that about him. So, it was, it was cool to introduce him to fans more. Yeah, like, after his press conference, uh, his locker room interview on Sunday after the game, there was a lot of buzz about him. He had a great game and he had these hilarious quotes. People were like, Charlie Kohler, who's this guy? He's funny. Like, I like this guy. <laughs> and so, he started to get some kind of nationwide attention. Uh, after that but he's somebody that that has been quietly working and you're starting to see as we said to him like his personality shine he's a funny guy smart guy and it, it was entertaining just to get to know him a little bit better and I think he's going to continue to make some plays for this yeah. team I think he's an important guy yeah I agree he's, he's in a very important role you know and 
a lot of obviously a lot of attention goes on Mark and Isaiah and their fantastic tight ends, but it's really the trio. And and when I've had conversations with Mark and with Isaiah, they're like, look. Charlie Kohler is a really good player. Like, do not forget about Charlie when you're talking about our tight ends. Yeah. You know, like he, Mark specifically told me, Charlie Kohler is going to go and have a long career in this league. Like mm-hmm. you watch, mm-hmm. right? And and to that point, you saw Josh Oliver, like you said, got paid by the Vikings. Like, you know, and when you're, when you can establish yourself as a blocker and he's worked really hard to get better at that part of his game, the receiving skills haven't gone anywhere. You know, so like if you can do both, man, you can really have a long, productive career in this league. And I think Charlie will. Uh, we should have told him about during training camp when he was catching a bunch of balls in practice and mm, you were doing, you were giving the feed. I, feed I told him. you then. The feed me. I told you then. You, you should have just. You, I'm just giving you. I'm I got it up for I, you. I completely forgot about that until you just mentioned it. Feed, me, feed Charlie Kohler. I was ahead of the curve on that one. <laughs> I, I, I will. Say, one of the things that always struck me about him is like he. If you're watching the pod, like he's a big guy, like, you just see him. You he looks the part. He takes the field, and like he's tall, he's long. Like he is a physically imposing guy, which mm-hmm. is part of the reason why he's working out so well as a blocker, in addition to the receiving aspect. But I'm just like, I remember the first time he really took the field that rookie season after dealing with the injury, and you're like, oh, this guy looks like he can play. Like we'll mm-hmm. see, but like he looks like it. And um, and so I've always been intrigued with him from that standpoint. And now we're starting to see it come to fruition. Yeah, it's very neat. So he also. Gave us the great segue to our next guest. Yes. Uh, the Ravens team clinician, Trisha Bent Goodley. Yeah. And so we are going to bring her on. We we didn't, you know, not going to be able to ask her about Charlie. There's client, you know, privileges. So right, right. We can't do that. But we're going to talk to her about her job behind the scenes of this organization. Well, Ravens fans, we are now really excited to be joined by the Ravens team clinician, Dr. Trisha Bent Goodley. And we are just so excited to have you joining us here today on World Mental Health Day. And yes. uh, this is your this is your arena. And so we <laughs> wanted to have you uh, on the podcast today to talk about the work that you do for our, or our organization and with our players. So just to kind of kick things off, can you describe what it is that you do, your role here with the organization? Yeah, sure. Thank you first for having me. I, I appreciate that. Today is a really great day. I think what I love most about being here is that we pay attention to mental health every single day, but it's great to be able to highlight it on World Mental Health Day specifically. Um, this is my 10th season as a team clinician. And what I se- essentially do is I provide the mental health, emotional health and wellness supports to our players, our coaches and our staff. So that looks like everything from providing therapy um, to providing mental health education, working with our team if there's a mental health crisis. Um, We work together in our health and wellness committee. So I'm a part of that committee and have an opportunity to work across all disciplines just to ensure that there is support for emotional and mental health issues across our organization. So I'm really excited to be able to offer that every single day of the week to our players, coaches, and staff. That's awesome. And specifically on World Mental Health Day and the week leading up to it, are there any special things that you're doing with the team? So we've done a few things um, leading up to World Mental Health Day. Uh, Yesterday, actually, we had some wonderful dogs here to do some (laughs) little bit of uh, dog, you know, therapeutic dogs that could be here with our players and mm-hmm. and our coaches and our staff as well. I got some time with it. You got some good time with <laughs> yeah, it. I missed and out. I did too. Yes. I did too. And I absolutely loved it. Um, and so that was a wonderful opportunity um, to just be able to have that resource here in the building. We did a gratitude wall um, for the players. We'll offer um, some education and support around wellness um, for World Mental Health Day, the theme of which is to prioritize mental health in the workplace. Mm -hmm. So we'll have a really great conversation about what Raven's wellness means. Um, And so just kind of did a, a, a range of different kinds of things just to begin to, again, as part of creating mental health awareness, but also just really talking about what wellness looks like for us here in this environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I think it's over the past decade or so, mental health and sports has started to become a Mm -hmm. much larger piece of the conversation. And we've on the podcast had lots of conversations about our players and the conversations with you and others in this space. How have you seen this focus grow over the last, you know, decade? You know, I would say that one of the things I've seen um, is that our young people come here um, 
already having been introduced to the world of mental health and feeling a little bit more willing to talk about it. Mm -hmm. And and I honestly think part of that is um, the aftermath of COVID. You know, I think that time period um, was really tough for a lot of people. And one of the things I think that we see now um, are folks being able to have that conversation a little bit more freely. I mean, certainly there's still mental health stigma and that's why having days like this are so important. At the same time, you know, I, I'm a believer that so much is driven from our young people, our players who come here ready and prepared to have that conversation um, and talking more freely about what they may have going on uh, so that we can be a good resource and support to them. Yeah. So I, I just think that, you know, there's a lot that's happened in the world. The world has changed a little bit around this topic. And um, I'm excited that our our players um, especially are out talking about it openly. I love that. That's yeah. awesome. I, I think the work that you're doing is is really awesome. And and I love to learn more about people's jobs and like what goes into their typical work day, right? So I guess first, you know, what does a game day look f- like for you? So for game day for me, I am, you know, making sure that I have some touch point with the majority of our players, Mm -hmm. um, whether that is on a text um, or on the field. So pregame, just being available, um, talking to guys, uh, just just being a resource to them before our game. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that's whether we're here or if we're on the road, you know, just being able to be present and available to them if they need anything. Uh, And then also I try to say speaking into them during, you know, ahead of game day, Mm -hmm. um, just to be an encouragement voice. And then, and then after game, you know, after the game being available, I think the only thing that might uh, be a little bit different is, you know, if there's something that happens on the field uh, that would require my support, then I will be available to them in the locker room so that they have that additional support there. Mm -hmm. Um, For example, if a player gets hurt, I'll be there. And um, if a family member needs support around that, then I'll be there to support them too. So, so just, you know, for me, my days are planned, but at the same time, whatever kind of happens, I just kind of move into it. And that's what it's Mm -hmm. like for me on game day too. I I don't necessarily know what I'm walking into, but we're going to go for it and uh, make the best of whatever the situation is. And do you find that players most often come to you for on field help or off field kind of life help? The gamut. You know, the gamut. Um, I think that one of the things about this role is you you really have to be able to move in either of those spaces. Um, We are there to be a support, whether it is around life issues, whether that's something that has been planned or an emergency that comes up Mm. and and also. there to help support, you know, in terms of their mental performance and providing them with mental skills training um, as well. So just really offering the gamut of what it looks like for wellness across the continuum. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's it's interesting because, you know, fans may see photos of you or video of you on the sidelines, either before games or at practice even. You know, I think it's that's one of the things that I think is really cool is that you're you're often in the mix in these moments, in these situations. And when we go out to practice here in a little bit, you know, you'll be out there. um, What are you when you're watching practice, you know, like what are you, we look at it from a, from a media eye, like what are you looking at it from your standpoint and and how do you try to use those observations to help you in, in coaching these players on mental health? So I think for me, um, I always say I'm not there studying everybody. Like, you know, I don't want anyone to feel Watching body conscious. language. You'll read the podcast right? and say, oh no. Um, <laughs> but for me, I do uh, I do pay attention to how a guy might react in a play or um, I, I pay attention. I do pay attention to body language. Actually, mm-hmm. I kind of have a sense of how our players move. Uh, and if, and if there's a diversion from that, then I'm going to probably reach out and just say, Hey, can we just chat? Mm-hmm. Um, and then I'll share what I observed. And if I'm off, then, you know, I'm way off, mm-hmm. but, um, for the most part, I've been pretty, pretty accurate in those moments. So I use it as a time just to kind of see what the energy is like. Mm-hmm. Um, and what kind of messaging that I should be providing and offering through the week as a support and a resource. Um, but yeah, during practice, I'm, I'm kind of paying attention to all of those things and checking in 
um, if need be. Interesting. And it's, it's kind of like an overarching approach, right? Like coaches are coaching the players on, on the techniques and the X's and O's and our strength and conditioning staff are, are getting their bodies, you know, in peak physical and condition. You're working on the mental side of things, you know, in your opinion, in your line of work, how important is the mental side of football? Yeah, so um, we have a podcast that we offer to the players. And uh, one of the things that that always starts with is um, I always say, um, you know, if if our play is 85, is 85 percent, if if the mental part of our play is 85 percent of the game, then we're going to go ahead and tackle that. Right. Mm. And um, I don't know if I have like an exact percentage, Mm -hmm. but what I will say is that there's an intricate interplay. And that's why being able to work collaboratively is so important. So you hear me say a lot, our and we, Mm -hmm. Uh, there's only one team clinician, that's me, but I feel like mental health is an important part of all of the work that we do. Mm -hmm. So our health and wellness committee, which includes every, everyone on the football side that touches our our players, it's an opportunity for us to collaborate and work together. Mm -hmm. Um, because sometimes there's just a connection between the body and, and the mind. And it's important for us to work collaboratively to help support that player, wherever it is that they're at. And so I think there's definitely a connection and I don't know, I wouldn't say that there's a percentage because I think mm-hmm. it could look different for people at different times in their lives, right. different times. If in you're the rehabbing season. from an injury. Well, men- that's mental too though. I mean, Absolutely. right, right, right. Um, but I think it's really just about <laughs> making sure that we're collaborating. We're working together to support the total wellness of our players. Yeah. And that's the approach that we take. That's why I always say we and our, because mm-hmm. um, I think mental health is something we all have to own in in different ways. It's awesome. You know, I've, it, it's been really cool. You, you're often involved on some c- company-wide initiatives, oftentimes around tragedy or difficult yeah. moments and, and uh, people turn to you for support and guidance and advice and a listening ear and, and all of those things. And, I, and you've been pretty impactful when we've had some hard times, you know, in recent years, which is really significant and, and also good times as well. Of course, it's not, it's not just the hard times, but where do you, for you, like when you look at things moving forward, like where do you see mental health in sports going in the future, given all that's, it's growing to get to this point. I think that we, meaning just how we look at sport and incidentally, um, since you mentioned this is pro athlete mental health awareness week. And um, that started October 3rd ends on October 10th on world mental health day um, and brings attention to uh, just what mental health looks like across sport. And one of the things that I would say about about this initiative, it's a collaboration between NFL Total Wellness and NBA Mind Health and then, you know, other professional organizations that sports organizations that collaborate. I think that we have to build a mental health infrastructure. Right. We have to build uh, an environment where mental health, we're mental health friendly. I think our athletes demand that in a lot of ways now. They're much more aware, they're much more open, and they're wanting to see an infrastructure and a support team that's there to support their mental wellness. And so I think as we move forward, sport, different sport organizations um, are going to really have to begin to work through whatever their stigma might be uh, around mental health to be able to offer those resources. I think there's still some people who feel like if someone shares that they have a mental health challenge, they're not as strong Mm -hmm. or they're not as focused or they won't be as great as they're in their craft. And what we know really is that as we approach the wellness of athletes, right, they can be even that much more productive, that much better at their craft, that much uh, more able to accomplish. And so I think that we, you know, meaning our, again, our, you know, as we look at World Mental Health Day, in sport, we have to reconsider how we think about mental health. I'm grateful because my role here was solidified in 2015, which was four years before the CBA um, required every club to have a team clinician. Mm -hmm. I'm one of a few full-time team clinicians in the league. And I think what I love about being here in our tough days right? And in our great moments is that there is support for mental health and what I do here. I don't feel like there's that stigma. I don't have to balance that um, 
I just have to show up and offer the best that I can on any given day. That's and awesome. that's what I love. That's great. That's great. Well, I'm going to have to get some time on your schedule because I've had to deal with this guy for 13 years now. <laughs> so, that's the biggest challenge. I think, I think they're in a good, I think you two are in a good rhythm. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us. Thank, thank you, Dr. You. Trish. Appreciate yeah. it. Well, really good conversation with Dr. Trish. Uh, you know, she's somebody here who's an important person behind the scenes, uh, has the trust of a lot of players and staff and, yeah. and everybody. And uh, it was good to just learn about you know, her role, exactly what goes into it and just the importance of it in this organization. Yeah, it's neat. You know, oftentimes, not oftentimes, but sometimes you go down the cafeteria and you just see her and a player or her and a couple of players and they're just talking you yeah. know and and you see definitely the the players value her and and what she brings the resources that she brings to the table it's 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 a very big deal for teams that i think a lot of fans probably don't recognize yeah so again this is world mental health day so uh really enjoy the conversation with dr trish and uh there's a big game coming up on sunday and uh, we're yeah. really excited about that ravens commanders one o'clock at m&t bank stadium the battle of the beltway it's gonna be battle a lot of the beltways of two Belt. beltways 495, 695. That's true. There we go. Um, thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but that game is coming up uh, on Sunday, and uh, we are going to f- do our full preview podcast coming out on Friday morning where we really dive into the specifics of that game. So that's it for us here on the podcast today. But as always, you can email us at the lounge at ravens.nfl.net. Thank you so much for listening. We'll be back with you tomorrow. 